Hey everybody, we're going to go ahead and get, keep on going. And what I want to do is kind of an overview of the um, refrigeration system or, or you know the air conditioning system. Uh, and then we're going to kind of break it apart. I have uh, a video on compressors that I want to kind of focus on pretty much you know, next, I believe. Uh, so just look forward to it. So let's go ahead and get started. Like always, we're going to start off with a PowerPoint. Uh, and here we go. All right. So uh, when we when we really get into this, uh, I really let's see now if I can find what I'm going. All right, we should be good. Oh, here we go. Here we got it. We got it. We just put it on the wrong screen. All right. So um, it's it's going to be a little bit of a view in a way too, but what I want to do is kind of go all the different components that were involved in it. Uh, we kind of talked about it when we were getting into the refrigeration cycle, and, but I want to kind of show you some of the components, you know, better than what you know, I kind of described them in, in the last, uh, last video. So uh, you've all seen this. Please keep on remembering to see this. You'll see this in some of your exams as we go along. And I want to make sure you do well. If you have any uh, thoughts about this, uh, these kind of pictures and stuff like that, if they don't work for you, if they do work for you, if you know of something that's better, please get a hold of me and I will definitely, you know, do my best to help you out. And also, uh, if you've got something better, please feel free to share it with me. All right. So. One of the things uh, we, we want to talk about is the condenser. The condenser is right after compressor, if you remember correctly. And with that condenser, we're condensing. Basically, that's what it is. And you'll find in some make some models. And I'll get deeper into this. That that is one of the biggest uh, issues with uh, you know not cooling properly. And I'll, I'll kind of show you some really easy and you know sometimes we don't really think about it ways of making it work better so this is the condenser the airflow goes across it you take all the warmer air remember don't forget that we're that uh, the heat is it going to cold or cooler a cooler area and i'll give you some tips on it when we get into our diagnostic part of this too as we go along. Remember, we're just doing it over here right now. So the condenser, and then this is one of the key, uh, one of the key things. And we actually had an issue in the shop. Uh, the, the electric fan wasn't coming on. So this could be, uh, you know, a, a reason for the AC not working properly. And it will be, I'll tell you right now. If the fans don't come on, you're gonna have an AC problem. Uh, there are electric fans. If you have an older vehicle, you may have an old mechanical fan. Uh, sometimes they they're stacked. They'll have you know electric fan and a clutch fan on top of it. And when I get into the cooling system section of this class, we'll be talking more about this specific. Again, we're just going an overview on this. So depending on how the condensers are made, is you know a lot of times is how well they cool. Uh, there's different styles, uh, there's different types. So uh, I think I've said this before in class, but there's a round tube type and there's also the flat tube type. And it's just the way the manufacturer puts it together and it's about transferring heat. Now, one of the things I wanna show you on this particular one, and this is where I, I believe you heard me say sometimes that you can't flush the stuff out of some of the condensers. And this can be a very big problem right here. Uh, kind of blown up on my screen here, you know, to make it a little smaller. But this, you notice how we've taken this pencil, and you know, for you, just as a joke, you know, like that, for you that don't know what a pencil is, this is what we used to write with when we were in school. Yeah, we, we all know what pencils are. Uh, but anyways, uh, see how small those holes on those tubes are. And you start getting debris in the system, this can be a big problem. And sometimes it gets wedged in there and you can't get it out. 
Uh, it's very, very, you know, small tubing in this one, or, you know, fins, you know, as you might want to call them too. So you want to make sure uh, if something grenades that you protect yourself. And what I mean by is the, comp the compressor coming apart, protect yourself. Uh, when you do your uh, estimates, we want to make sure you cover the, all the bases. Um, a lot of times, if I see something that's really gone bad, I'll recommend the condenser and sometimes even the evaporator. And you're going to be, it's going to be a lot of work trying to get all the debris out of there. Because when a compressor comes apart, it will shed it through the whole system. And where's the first place it goes to? Right up here right into the condenser. That usually gets the brunt of it. All right, so, uh, you know, refrigerant kind of winds through and that's how it does. It's just like your radiators, you know, your radiators, your uh, kind of like parallel radiator flow radiators going across. And then you have, uh, you know, the heat going across. Uh, again, you know, just like your uh, cooling system radiators, you can actually take a, heat gun, or like a little infrared gun, and go across and check temperatures across. And you can see it should be uh, from the inlet to the outlet, you should see a big decrease in temperature. Um, I, I don't have exact numbers, but I would say it should be coming down quite a bit. So if you're at 200, if you're not reaching, I would say somewhere around 150, even, you know, even farther down below the hundreds, uh, you, you definitely uh, have some kind of problem there. And like I said, I'll show you some, you know, different uh, ways of checking and when we get into the diagnostic part. So it, it, because of this, I, I, there's some condensers that actually do, and this is an, important to know, they'll take and make it even smaller tubing toward the end of their routing of the actual condenser. They'll actually start off with a lot and they'll get, get down to even smaller. And this is I've uh, seen on some vehicles uh, out, in, in, out in market. So uh, here is kind of what I, I really, um, as some of you, uh, I explained it to, but when you're looking for the condense, when you're looking for the receiver dryer, okay, you may not, find it on some of these um, vehicles. You're going to look all over the place. And basically what they've done, they're, they've taken a, this, a um, condenser, okay? And they've actually taken it and built uh, a, a desiccant bag inside. So one of the big things in a receiver dryer is that desiccant bag. And you, if you don't find one, start looking for a little hump on the side of the condenser. So there's like a little bit of a, a, a mo yeah, I don't want, I don't want to say a modulator, but but it's kind of is like a modulator. I, I, they use this terminology modulator, and I don't really agree with the terminology, but it it does work very similar. So it's basically uh, taking and allowing it to go past. This uh, this uh, this condensed this this actually desiccant bag and there's a little kind of a gas and liquid separation in it and that's basically what happens with a uh, receiver dryer you've got a little space in there and it, it kind of separates between the liquid and actual the uh, the, uh, the liquid and and actually the gas itself so very common very common. Uh, for, here is a uh, ex actually an expansion valve. Now I'm, I'm going to talk about expansion valves, and there's going to be ex expansion blocks as we go along too. So basically, it's a, a, a device that actually controls the flow, and that's what we do after we go past the conde uh, past the condenser. We go to lines, and we'll go and actually cause it. Right before the evaporator, we'll actually control, we'll change the state of the gas, if you remember correctly. So we start off from the compressor. I should change the state of liquid. No, we're not changing the state of liquid. We're in the 
uh, you know, the evaporator, we have a state of change. But with the expansion valve, what we're going to be doing is we're going to take a high pressure liquid, if you remember correctly, and turn it into a low pressure liquid. And then when it gets into the evaporator, that's when we start um, causing it to go back to a gas, if you remember correctly. All right. So this is one a type. A type. It's got a little uh, capillary type tube on it, and it, it pushes down into the uh, you know evaporator to get a temperature. It's a it's a little a sensing bulb inside, and when that you know it changes the gas state, it will actually open or close that actual uh, passage inside the actual expansion valve. So again, if you, if you, you want to look at it, so at first we have the bulb, you know, you know kind of going, we could, we, we can have the bulb, like I said before, going right down inside the, uh, the, the evaporator. We can also have it connected um, or both uh, together um, and causing it to change the state of that bulb. And then we, in which almost like a modulating type one. And then we can also have a block. It's actually, you'll find them pretty common in a lot of the uh, vehicles and you know, Chrysler and different ones actually had a uh, block affair. And you might, you, you probably even find uh, quite a bit of them in the shop vehicles we have. It's actually a block versus a, a expansion valve. I do have some, and we I will be sharing with you when we'll be you know taking them apart when we get to that section, and you'll be actually taking the uh, um, cases apart, and you'll be able to see them. All right. So again, this is just showing you a little bit about now. One of the things. I want to, you know, kind of, you know, again, coming back to keeping things clean and all is that it when it's such a small area, what can happen is you can get debris inside here and then it won't seat properly. And you have a, a problem with the, you know, of course not cooling properly. So this is something that I, uh, it can happen. I'm, I don't see very often, but it can happen. So, um, this is an expansion block, like I said before, and this is actually has a diaphragm and spring loaded. And again, when it gets to a certain temperature, it senses the amount of the temperature inside, you will change how wide or how narrow that actual uh, valve is open. The other type that we uh, that is out there is called a, a fixed orifice tube. Now this is different. Um, on your expansion blocks and your expansion valves, or the TX EVs as they call them, they, you have a receiver dryer, or you'll have that. You remember, we have that little um, kind of modulator type system or a, a desk and bag inside of the actual condenser. Now, on a, a fixed orifice tube system, it's different your fixed orifice tubes are going to be closer to your evaporator. So this one uh, is a small little fixed tube. It's got has a screen on it and this is what gets plugged up sometimes after you know wear and also the compressor is going to be having a little bit of material coming through. This is one of the things I look at when I start uh, hearing some noises in the compressor. And sometimes when I'm just doing service work on it, I think we have a problem with cooling. I'll take that tube out. And if you see any metal flaking on it, I would be very concerned, okay? So this is where I, uh, and they're, the fixed orifice tubes are in all kinds of colors. So this is a pretty much where a, a majority of your fixed orifice tubes will be at. Now you're at probably asking how does not that tube not just keep on going down through? It actually has a little indent and it keeps it from moving. And uh, yeah, I have a few um, uh, um, evaporator boxes. I think I can still show you what one looks like, but these are getting to be. Um, not as popular as they used to, you know, they used to be. It's a, it was a very 
I would say almost an inexpensive way of running an air conditioning system, but they do have their own drawbacks, you know, just like everything else does. So uh, this is a, a, a tube that actually, it, it actually adjusts depending on temperature like that. So this is something that's been out for a while. I wouldn't say it was the very beginning, but these, you really need to <laughs> make sure you put the right one back in. Uh, I've seen some people you know, do some silly things. They take this out, oh, what the heck? It looks like a bunch of metal in there. And then uh, they put in a standard uh, fixed surface and it does not perform as well as it could like that. All right, so, and also you have another type one is this is an electronic one. It's actually adjusted by the computer. The computer takes, you know, and depending on uh, the demand, uh, the, uh, you know, kind of like the uh, cool load on it, and this is what it's going to adjust it. All right, so this is one style, you know, it has a receiver dryer on it, so you know right off the get-go it's going to have an expansion valve in it. Uh, so this is, you know, one style. Now, again, kind of going back to the, uh, the different types of, uh, of evaporators, okay? Uh, uh, this one is a kind of a older design uh, on your left, and then on your right is a little bit of a newer design, but they, they're, they keep on making them better and better you know the whole idea is to actually be able to absorb the heat from inside the the actual capacitor compartment or the cab of the, the vehicle and the way that they put them all together you know i mean and they're going to be in a box kind of affair inside the car so that makes it a little bit more fun to <laughs> have to you know, as you know as, we know it's, it's, it always puts more time on the clock for us actually to do. So this is where you want to make sure you get your, uh, you know, prices down correctly. You know, you're not going to do it in an hour unless you have one of the old systems that was like four volts and you pull it on out. This one is quite complicated to do. But here is actually showing the evaporator uh, in the case, so they call it a evaporator case or a heater core box. Uh, it just depends on how they want to name it. And then it has the uh, blower motor uh, attached to it to actually get that airflow to go through. And then we have the good old receiver dryer type system or the uh, fixed orifice type system. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the receiver dryer still going to it. Uh, oh, we're talking about boxing. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Sorry about that, folks. So on this particular one, we actually have a, a box of um, uh, some icing that could happen inside the box. Um, but this is where we want to make sure that uh, we uh, check temperatures. That's what I was having you do the other day. I want to make sure you check temperatures at all times. Now, if you get icing to form up, it can actually cause problems with airflow, of course. And this particular one uh, actually you know, is showing you know, what possibly could happen. And one of the things that can happen is uh, if we get moisture inside the system, we can actually have a problem with uh, um, kind of causing you know, moisture with the refrigerant can actually form an acid. I think I've told you before, but these acids start you know, kind of, one, they can rust and you know, the metal parts and also they can cause blockages. And uh, moisture is like little crystals and it can actually you know, form. You'll see a bunch of icing around a section like that. But I just they, we just wanna give you an, an idea why the the actual uh, receiver dryer has a desk and bag inside. You know, why do I have a desk and bag? Well, this is the reason. We want to make sure we absorb as much moisture. But the bit, big thing is to make sure that the system has been evacuated and put into vacuum properly. 
And then on your cumulator systems, uh, a little bit different than an actual, uh, a lot different really, uh, than a receiver dryer. This one's a little bit different. And this one actually has several things to it that are, uh, I don't want to say better, but they're different the way they put them together. So this one actually has a space for the gassing, you know, which are, you, you want to have gas, the gas going through. And, that, and that's a given. You don't want to have liquids really uh, flowing through up to the, uh, to the, well, that's what is it? You don't want uh, liquids going to the compressor because then you can cause damage to the compressor. So the compressor should be moving it along uh, and compressing, okay? Go, uh, press, again, compressing from a high, a high pressure. Well, the compressor pushes it along uh, from a low pressure gas to a high pressure uh, gas, which then in your condenser, you're going to drop it to a high pressure liquid. Before that point, you don't want a, a liquid in there. That's just why this is why they put the uh, uh, the accumulator like this. They'll put the accumulator right over to the evaporator. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, right up to uh, right position, right up to or close to the actual evaporator. And this way, it will get it to go through. You know, it will keep it from being. Uh, it will keep it from going into the compressor as a, uh, a liquid, more of a gas. Uh, so basically, you're going to be going through the system. And if, if we bring up that old picture again, I'll, I'll bring it at the end. But anywhere before then, you really don't want anywhere before the compressor, you don't want a gas. And you don't want a liquid. You just want straight gas onto it. So this gets to be a little bit of you know kind of, kind of trying to vision it, but definitely you want to make sure you have liquid where it's supposed to be and gas where it's supposed to be. Anything different, and we're gonna when we get into diagnosis, I'll really get deep into this. You could have problems, and it could be a, a lack of cooling. You can um, damage the compressor. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can happen, and don't forget your um, your refrigerant is actually uh, transporting the, uh, the actual oil at the same time too. So at the bottom of this, it actually has a little small little hole. And sometimes it's just a little drilled hole. Sometimes it has a little filter on it. And that's to keep any kind of debris that might be uh, in the oil. And it allows the oil to flow through and pick it up and go to the compressor. And that's really key on these kind of things that you wanna make sure the compressor is always lubricated, always. So that, but this is how they do it through the system like that. All right, uh, accumulator is going to be in different shapes and sizes. Remember, the accumulator goes within a fixed orifice tube. It does not uh, go like a receiver dryer. So uh, uh, you've seen with the accumulator locks, the receiver dryer is like this. It is different. So uh, we do have. On, the, on our actual uh, receiver dryer, we actually have a filter on the bottom, just a little bit different than we do with our accumulators. Now this one shows one with a, a sight glass on it. Now the sight glasses are, uh, I, I, you know, not as popular. You may not even see them anymore. Um, it, it back in the day, that was what we consider a charging uh, sight glass, and it, it really is not a accurate way to actually go ahead and do to charge it because it could be too much or too little. Uh, always remember to weigh it in and weigh it out. All right, so we put different lines. You know, you'll notice that some are solid uh, metal lines and some are going to be rubber lines. Anywhere around the compressor or anything that might move, uh, you're going to see more of a uh, rubber line to it. And those rubber lines are not just your regular radiator hoses. And we'll talk more about that when we get the line section of the class too, but they are more rigid. Uh, they'll hold the pressures and that's what we need on our actual air conditioning machine system. So here again, showing the three major sections, uh, you know, 
or the so whole section, I should say, of uh, the actually air conditioning uh, lines. So you're gonna see, you know, of course, it's right close to the compressor. You're gonna have this line here, going to dis as they call it, discharge lines going right into the compressor. This one's gonna have to have a little bit of flexibility to it. And then also on the outside here, and it's a lot of times too, towards the firewall where we start putting like the evaporator here, you'll have some flexibility too, because you do, you may have that little bit of movement going on. So it's not uncommon. It can, you know, it can be a salt line, but sometimes they run in a rubber line to it, to it also. And we look at the lines for uh, by different sizes, so outside diam diameter, inside diameter, but a lot of times we'll you know, look at the metal lines and tubings as the outside di diameter on our particular lines. And there is all kinds of sealing um, sections or uh, sealing methods, let's put it that way. We can have, you know, uh, fittings or, you know, like what was shown here on these particular ones, and these guys is what keeps it in and keeps it sealed. It keeps it so the refrigerant doesn't come out. And depending on what kind of system you have, most of them I see uh, nowadays are uh, either a gasketed type or a rubber uh, sealer, the uh, rubber oil winger type thing. This is going to be generally, this is ones you're going to see. Um, now, in some of your heavy duty equipment, they actually just use the sealing surfaces. Now, this is where you know, sometimes it gets really critical on those sealing surfaces. Sometimes you'll find some on uh, some lines on some compressors too uh, that they bolted up that way. But be you know, take the time to look at the sealing surfaces. Uh, if you want to make sure they're nice and smooth and they do not have any kind of debris to them, if they do you have potential of leakage and almost always there will be a leak to it. Um, different types of sealing. Uh, some actually have the spring locks uh, and it's not uncommon. And this has uh, been pretty popular. And what we have to do is have a special tool uh, to actually release those springs, those spring cages. So this is something that you, uh, you will I've got a slide on it in just a little bit here, but this is what uh, it may look like uh, on your, your particular vehicle there. And it's got a couple O-rings to it. It has that lock assembly, and then you will have to have something similar to this kind of tool. They come in different sizes, which are normally they do them by colors, what color, and that's how you have to slide it on. And then you're gonna actually, uh, do a little bit of a pull on it. And you don't wanna get crazy at it. You don't wanna you know, pull the whole, like they're doing an evaporator right here. You don't wanna pull that whole evaporator out of the, the firewall area or the bulkhead connector as they call it that is. But you wanna be very careful on how you uh, remove it. And when you're putting it back together, again, you wanna use lubricant. Uh, usually I, what I use uh, is actually the refrigerant oil that uh, the system has with it. And it usually works pretty well. Now, sometimes you can get, uh, and a lot of times you can, you can get some uh, cage holders and I'll, I'll, I'll show you some of them a little bit later on and when we start talking more about lines. And all. So O-rings, you should have a good selection of O-rings and you wanna have the right O-rings for the right gases and oils that you're using. Uh, they do make different ones. Uh, some are multi-usage type things, but a lot of them are going to be in particular for just that particular refrigerant and oils and stuff. They'll be black, green, blue. I've seen some yellow ones too. So it really depends on who makes them and what, what they are used for. So again, uh, we do have to know a little bit of electrical. We'll have electrical section in this also. As we go along, it won't be your full-fledged electrical class, but it's going to give you a little bit of the basics behind it and how it works. Because you, you definitely need to know how to electrical and also computer uh, technology to work on air conditioning, not like the old ones. This was an early, early model type. We uh, it was not much to it. 
you had an ignition switch fed over to a fuse it went over to the ac switch which was part of the blower switch and then all you had was a temperature switch and a compressor clutch and then your blower had a little blower resistor and you had your blower motor and that was pretty much the way the old systems were and it controlled you know the ac compressor and it also controlled it was just showing you really basics because there's more to it but it showed you know just you know, the blower motor and that was that was it and a lot of times you had a slide button or a push button for the speed and then you had uh a, a, another maybe a slide and then you might have had a push button to turn on the ac system too or like my old 63 chevy you had a big old long um <laughs> A big old long um, kind of like a little uh, cable that went and pulled up that way to get it to work. And then uh, there's all kinds of pressure switches, like I said a little bit earlier. Now the pressure switches could be all you know. You could have a high pressure switch. You could have a low pressure switch. It just depends on what they wanted to do. And they were pretty much an on-off type switch. Uh, you get uh, too high a pressure, it would turn. It would actually open the circuit. That way it would uh, turn the compressor off. If it was uh, a low pressure switch, it did the same thing. When it uh, went too low, it turned the compressor off. Uh, and they, it, you know, th there was a system out there and it's not as popular, but we had what we called a suction throttling or STV that prevented the evaporator you know, from going below 30 degrees uh, uh, on it too. So there was an, another device put onto it, basically what it was. So then you can have, of course, you know, we have zone control, we have rear AC, we can have all these different um, bells and whistles. And we'll talk more about that when we get more into the electronic section of this class with that. So. And of course, you know, you want to make sure your flanges all match up, make sure your O-rings are all good, good when you're going back together. I would not, re, um, except for in our lab, uh, go and uh, put old O-rings on a customer's car. Yeah, I wouldn't do it because that's, that's actually you, you getting ready to cause a problem with your customer and have a leak and stuff like that. So just be very careful. and and. You want to make sure when you're lining things up, and this this is where I found uh, quite a bit of you know, well, a little bit when it comes to um, you know um, aftermarket. Uh, sometimes with aftermarket, the lineup is not as good as the original, and you know it, it's out there. So you want to make sure you match everything up, make sure it's going to line up properly. If it's going to be too much of a problem, you may want to actually go with OEM. You know, a lot of times that's what we do, but it's a more expensive, I'll tell you that. Uh, so there's different types of crimps. Uh, some, you know, you may not even do this. I mean, at the uh, air conditioning shop we had, we had a uh, crimping device. This was actually to create hoses. So you're going to see the finished effect on the bottom here. Okay. So depending on what kind of crimper you had, it could be just straight crimp like this, or it could be a kind of joined in crimp going across here. So this is a hand type crimper. And this also is, oh, this is just showing the same hand, hand crimp crimper. Now, some are hydraulic too. It's just a little pump, you do it, or you push a button and it'll crimp it that way too. Um, it's just, you know, the, this type is a little bit cheaper, but you can actually have ones like that. So. One of the things that happens with the fixed orifice tube systems is that fixed orifice tube's been in there for a while and you need to get it out. And if you don't use the right tool, I've seen some techs go in there and just grab a needle nose, a pair of needle nose and go down and grab inside there and be very successful. I've seen ones go down there and um, grab it because it's plastic and it's been there for a long time. That little O-ring will seize and they go to grab it and they break it. And then there's another tool for that to actually pull it out from there. There's actually a you know specialized so I'll, I'll find it for us and I'll show you what it looks like. But um, the the or fixed orifices come in all different shapes and colors. So make sure unless the uh, you know documentation says to change it to a different type of 
uh, different type of uh, you know tube, which sometimes they can upgrade them. Uh, they'll put like a white with a you know a yellow, or they'll put a black with a yellow, and they'll change the types of uh, uh, types of uh, fixed surfaces. But generally, it's the same one. So it's best to put the right fixed surfaces in all the time. All right. If you put the wrong one in, sometimes they don't fit and sometimes they just don't cool the way they should. All right. All right. I think this is going to be it for right now. Just kind of an overview of the different types of uh, devices. Uh, some kind of an overview and then we're going to be breaking it down to the compressors and to the specific uh, components as we go along and give you a little trips along the way. All right. Uh, we'll be putting up another video really soon. Take care of yourself. Bye for now.